Okay, Gary. Wow, it's really helped to learn to how to interpret you, you know. <laughs> you know, I can see inside all the uh, bluster, you know, acknowledgement of my points and you paying attention to the points. You know, sure, you sound like you're trashing them, but, I mean, I don't really care what... I mean, I'm sorry, I do care what you think about them. I'm interested in what you think about them, but it doesn't directly affect what I think about them. But anyway, first of all, accountability and gratitude conference report brought that up. Ask him. I don't, I don't know. When I said that I had it, I mean, I feel like if I put myself in compatibilist mode, which I can do, I understand the idea that it's all mechanistic in the sense that even if quantum mechanics is involved, it doesn't mean there's any freeness to it. So I under, I can imagine that. I really think I can imagine that. And I'm saying, in that case, I become a compatibilist. And I, I still feel, like, accountable for my actions. Even if I didn't... Like, for example, I feel somewhat accountable for slavery. And I support some sort of reparations or at least social programs that are, you know, taking into account that, yeah... Now, my family was poor. We never owned slaves. My grandmother did our genealogy. We never owned slaves. I know we never owned slaves. Um, but we, this nation was built on slaves to a certain degree. We paid taxes. We probably had just some amount of um, racism, if that was, you know, important to the material accountability, which I sort of think it is. But, you know, whatever. We benefited one way or another. So there's an accountability, even though in that case, even with free will, it was like, well, we couldn't really do anything about it. It was going on, you know. But I still feel an accountability. It's the same way in compatibilism. It's like the situation that you're in, yeah, suddenly, I guess you would have to hope because you're going to be accountable even though you don't have a choice. That, that's that's one of the terrible tragedies of, ooh, how painful. I'm going to be responsible for what I do. Like, I am mean to some friend or lover, and now I'm accountable for that. Well, when I have will, at least I can think, yeah, I'm accountable because I could have done something else. But if I couldn't have done something else, well, that's really hard, right? And so I'm accepting that. And then also the gratitude that I have an experience. Uh, for whatever reason, I see, to me it seems like I would have to have something like a genuine will. Most of the will is bullshit, okay? But some little kernel of genuine will, and then, you know, I'm trying to burrow down to that genuine part. And so even as a compatibilist, I would have gratitude that there was the subject, the spark thing. Okay. Now, you talk about how we can make a person in a holodeck, and I understand what you're talking about. Now, I used to think that. Um, everybody thinks different things at different stages. I'm not saying the fact that I used to think it means it isn't true somehow. It's just my experience was that I very much believed in it. I still believe you can make a, con a convincing person, right, that would convince. It would be good enough for the purposes of a holodeck. But I don't, you know, we haven't done anything near like that yet, and that's important. Come on, you. I mean, maybe it's inevitable that you'll be proved right here. But meanwhile, it hasn't been done, so we, you can't really say for sure. Now I think we're zeroing in on it, but I also think the part that hasn't been done and that we're not zeroing in on is this spark, this subjective experience. I don't think a good holodeck, per, I. I I did some AI for games, and I really think that the things I used, we could make a convincing person, arbitrarily convincing. Call it egotism, but the point is, I believe computationally you could do that. Uh, and if not me, maybe somebody else. And if you believe somebody else could do it, then, you know, it, it all amounts to the same thing. Of, of I do have a faith in the computational approach, but there's no little bit that would grow into the subjective experience. It would just be a convincing mannequin. 
a really convincing mannequin, which I personally think is very cool, and there is sort of a functional equivalence. I believe the Turing test is, is very influential on me, you know, and it's like, yeah, if you can convince me, that's a good test. But, you know, in terms of talking about there's two things, one, the behavior, and two, the experience of being the thing, then we, we still have an open question. Now, it's possible, and I always love Robert Heinlein on this kind of thing, where the computer gets arbitrarily, comp or no, it gets to a certain level of complexity, more than the speed, but let's say complexity and speed, and this phenomena emerges, and when it emerges, both of these, like, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but um, inertial mass and gravitational mass. Physically, it turns out they have two totally different meanings, but they're always exactly correlated. Okay, so maybe consciousness would be like that. The third person consciousness, as soon as you had a real appearance of something that was convincingly alive, no matter how much you tested it, that it would also have the internal experience. Interesting, but why? You know, seriously, why? That's, why, why would, I don't understand, I can imagine a behavior, because I've seen people be convinced by artificial things already and think they're real, and I mean, okay, to be trivial about it, kids, you know, give them a teddy bear, ooh, they think it's real, and it's, okay, but even adults, you know, interacting with computers in certain games, or I've seen people play demos and think they were playing because they were doing just what the demo did, because the demo's avoiding monsters. But anyway, okay, that's a, that's a tangent. Um, you were talking about trillions of water molecules. I have no idea what I was going to say about that, though, but you were talking, that, and that's cool, trillions of water molecules, that's always nice, um, like a bath, <laughs> okay, um, now, the con you, you brought up consciousness, you've been a little sympathetic to the idea that maybe there's a question there, versus willpower. Okay, and I'm really serious about, let's separate those questions. I'm also going to distinguish the fact that willpower is not some special power of me. You got it right. Don't malign it. Accept it. It's one thing you can get. You, you should say, well, at least when you're talking about power, you're not talking, Piro, about a superpower that you telepathically impose on things. You're talking about the idea that maybe you are the. That's why it's compatible with compatibilism, is because if 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 I I'm saying I am that power, it could still be an illusion, the freedom, because the power is always comes from somewhere. And come on, you know I'm not saying I'm keeping the thing for myself and I've created it all myself. No, I mean I'm saying my brain was created by genetics and that started up me with a bunch of biases and preconditions to how I think and how you think. So I, I do say will is important but I've always said even a strong will is relatively weak you know it's a paddle in the river I don't know if you've ever done that but if you've ever paddled around in a whitewater river that's not a lot of power compared to how much energy is really out there moving your boat it has to be wisely put in the water so it's important because you don't have much of it it's a it's a very very limited resource in my most optimistic theory of how much will someone can muster and I know a lot of the will is illusion so even you know optimistically the amount of will someone can muster for something is a very small amount of the energy that will quote unquote determine what's going on. So things tend to be mostly determinable. But people can put themselves in a situation where they determine surprising things. And that's an interesting question of how can they do that? Right? An avalanche flowing downhill can't veer to the left and accomplish something. You know? But humans seem to be able to do that. Or another interesting I mean I find interesting example is humans walk uphill. All animals can go ahead and walk uphill. Well, we know 
come on, this counts as a law of physics, things go downhill. Okay, so obviously there's a reason we aren't really defined physics, which is why I want to look to physics of how we do this, because the general model of physics would be, well, things go downhill. How does some chemical reaction decide to go uphill? You know, and it's not just living reactions. We could look at all kinds of things. You know, tidal waves and landslides and all sorts of things that go uphill because they've come downhill. There's a reason. But, um, but it, you know, we can start, since we don't agree on sort of some of the steps that are way out there, we can agree that, well, the first step is to wonder why we have this subjective experience. And even though we're not physicists, we can eat, think about physical laws and how that might be. Now, I spent a lot of time thinking about how computers might just spark up an internal awareness because things got complex enough. Okay, but then I lost that visualization. It didn't make sense to me anymore after a certain amount of expertise programming. I could be biased or burned out or because I do programming for practical reasons, maybe I, I couldn't see the, you know, the, like the really... Well, phantasmagorical ideas, the parts that were really fun at the time. But I didn't lose an interest in, like, I always loved recursion, which is behind fractals. And I love, but I loved it separate from that, and it's just cool that it's also related to fractals. And I always thought recursion is probably a part of a good AI. Okay, I still believe that. And I still believe it's just as cool as ever, but I what I lost was the idea that suddenly a first person view can emerge. A first person view has to emerge. That's why I think it's really valuable, not just for me. It doesn't make you think the way I'm thinking in terms of the results of the thought, but it's it's useful to think in kinds of emergence. There might be third and fourth examples, but I think these spread pretty well in the sense that with the magnetism, right you'd have little tiny parts that themselves did will but they wouldn't be like humans you know just like insects aren't like humans and they wouldn't even be like insects you know they might be to insects as insects are to us or even further you know and then there's the the fire emergence thing where the thing that an atom has is nothing like will what it's you know what I mean it's the reason a fire happens is because you have one chemical that is like itself and another chemical like itself but when they touch things happen so you could have atoms that you know when they touch there's a moment of consciousness or something I mean it has to be something like that I mean go ahead you're imaginative help me imagine what kind of physical process? Now, if you really want it to be a Newtonian one, well, you don't, actually. I'm sorry to even say that. If somebody wanted it to be a Newtonian one, which is the computational idea, the I, because I could explain how, but the Newtonian idea of mechanics fits really well with computers. You can simulate Newtonian mechanics to a certain degree, not 100% accurately, but there's an element of the sequentialism that it, I think is related, right? So, if you could simulate this in a computer is similar to saying it's mechanistic, right? If you're saying that it takes Einstein's ideas or relativity or something, well, you know, that's another thing altogether. Okay, let's see, where was I in my notes? Um, you were talking about where I got things from. That's a good point, yes. But, for example, if somebody is abused, uh, they and then they abuse others, that's explained by the fact that they were abused. On the other hand, I've known someone, there's someone over here, um, and I've known other examples, but this is, you know, a perfect example. A person's like, you know, I cannot even, I, I can't be physical with my kids at all. Even dragging them to their room because it's bedtime or any thing because I was abused and that also makes sense so what you have is one cause that could determine two different kinds of results who knows why it goes between one and the other you know you think it's the details 
that made it go one way or the other. And I agree, to an arbitrary degree of accuracy, it's the details. But since the degree of accuracy is never point-like, there's always some variability. That's all I'm really saying. In principle, it can be narrower and narrower and narrower, but there's always some, you know, gap. Now, how physics helps that is it says that, well, the smallest distance is a Planck distance. And that distance can be translated into time or space and, and lots of different things come from this, this minimum amount of energy in the Planck constant that make minimum amounts of all other elements. Okay, so a minimum amount means there's always an interval of some minimum, right? So yes, I do see my influence, and I'm deterministic in that sense, if we can allow for the idea of partial determinism, and the fact that my life has millions or at least thousands of individual data point events that I can collect the patterns from, but you can't get, collect a pattern from just one event, right, that's not a statistical sample. Why do you need a statistical sample? Because things are probabilistic. Okay. Um. I have no idea. I wrote whipping the asshole. Maybe somebody could tell me what I was talking about there. I hope that's a quote or something. I hope that's just not an idea like, oh, I'm going to write down whipping the asshole. Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, talked about hope again. I just, you know, I apologize about saying that. And, I, and you go on. It's not even nice what you said. Hope is for people that are in a bad situation. And how can I rag on them? Well, I'm just kind of going, you know, there's a weakness there. But mostly I have to admit, I was just thinking about myself, my own experience. Okay. I want to, you're right. I should be more sensitive. Um, if you're trying to get through life, and that's what I was really trying to say. You know, it's not true to say I redefined hope. That's not, this isn't one of those cases. I do that, but not in this case. I don't really think, I mean, I might have described how, you know, definitions of hope that might not be everyone in the dictionary, but that are number one and three and five. And the, and the point is, is that, yeah, if you, I was describing that, there's certain behaviors of my own that I don't think of as hope, but people could call hope fairly fit the definition. And, um, and but another thing is that I have had hope before, and you bring up my cat, um, which fair enough. I I don't know why it's okay because, but whatever. Um, because I've been, I've thought about that, and yes, we were chasing the kitten uh, out of the road at night sometimes, or I was up really late as I am sometimes, and I would go out there and she'd play along the side of the road and even go in the little gutter thing, I'm sure there were roaches in there to play with, and I would try to get her away, and we grabbed her, and my daughter uh, and I, uh, the old, my older daughter, at many, well, several times, she's only seven months, six months with us, um, I know more like five months and then she was, you know, eight weeks old when we got her or something. And, uh, I knew that she was at risk to that. And I did hope that she wouldn't get hit. But I know that seeing that I was hoping that was a evidence of a weakness that I didn't have control over it because I wasn't going to restrain her though I thought you know maybe it's good with the cat since they're indoor or outdoor the way I I do the the pets they I think they like to be outdoors so I try to get them both and they come into sleep and stuff at the very least or when they want to with in the case of cats but maybe I would keep the cat in a room closed it in the room and have it sleep in the room and when it was a kitten and get used to that because in the day 
they understand the road a little better at night, something, you know, a leaf goes out in the road, or birds seem to almost land there and try to draw them out. You never know. Um, so I did hope, but I see it as a sign of weakness, and I don't feel bad that I was weak. I literally was weak. What can I do? Not have a road that, what could I do? I was weak compared to, I, I, I did what I could, which was try to train the cat, which, like, we have one other cat, and it was here as a kitten, and none of the other cats up and down the street seemed to get hit on our road, and I know as a, if they grow up as kittens, they can figure it out. This cat grew up as a kitten, she was, but she was a playful kind of cat. And so if if it's the middle of the night and she's out doing her middle of the night cat thing and the road seems empty and something's flying across the road, she's looking at it probably for an hour. And, you know, in an hour, cars, that's why I'm moving. Because fuck that killer road. You know, I, um, the cat was totally a rescue. Like, I got suckered into keeping the cat. A friend of my daughter's came over with the cat. It was like... I wanted to keep this cat, well at first she's like, we're going to keep it, but then she's like, well no, my grandmother wanted to keep another one, I'm like, this cat, no way, is this cat going to the pound, you know, and, uh, but I wish I would have moved before, uh, because this and, you know, just the house in general, I like living in sort of country houses, but I've slowly moved back into the city and there's a lot of room here for a pool table, I'm going to have to give that up, because whatever, and, uh, but it's a much nicer house, and, uh, I, you know, when I keep it clean, it'll be clean, I, I've lived in a lot of houses, I've lived in single wall cabins out by creeks and stuff, and I love them, those are great, you know, but sometimes when you clean to the corner, there's a, there's a hole there in rotting wood, and in the case of Hawaii, it can mean mold and stuff, and I realize, okay, I'm ready to get away, I'm not, I'm not paranoid about it, not like saying, oh, but, you know, I'm just ready to move away from that a little bit. And it's and it happened because of the cat. I mean, the cat got hit, and then we're like, okay, this place sucks then. We love that cat. We love all our pets, but in just a few months, this cat was just like, this cat, my daughter would come off the bus and, and, and call her name, and she comes running out through the bushes, <laughs> I mean, like making a sound, crashing through the grass and stuff. And she really, so I don't really dig a place where the road, I mean, it's for someone else. Get some college students in here that can use the space and have parties and stuff. I've had enough. So, I'm not really maligning hope because a part of my personality, I mean, from other people's point of view, it might feel maligning. And I, I admit it, I'm, I'm sorry. But... From my point of view, it's like, I can admit when I am weak. I'm not infinitely strong, so I can admit when I'm weak, I'm strong at certain points and weak on others. And, and uh, you know, I was weak in, in doing that. And that even goes to blaming myself a little bit. It's like, weak, well, I knew I wanted to get out of here. I knew the cat had had problems. What if, before she had died, I thought, oh my God, she is going to get hit and I would have moved. It happened like that. I found a place like that when I wanted to move, and I've been thinking about moving. So, I could have done it like that before, right? On the other hand, who knows? You know, the timing, it's its all too hard to figure that kind of stuff out, because you can't figure it out, because not being able to figure out some things is what it means to say the universe has some material indeterminacy in it, in my opinion. You called me weak uh, for some of these things, and I don't really mind that, even when I disagree. Um, I don't really know why Bill Gates doesn't build a moon base. He, is, he could afford it. Now, uh, you said I create confusion, and then I try to solve it, and I could shorten the process by just not creating the confusion. And this is like, you know what? Thank you, yes, that's, I do that. I believe in confusion, all new knowledge 
comes after a path through some confusion. So yeah, so watch out for that. Um, the terminal optimism also, I was admitting sort of a weakness, that hopefulness. On the other hand, you know, I didn't really say, and the fact is my terminal optimism has been really productive. Um, some projects come to, you know, unfortunate ends and stuff, but I mean, uh, it still was most beneficial. If I'd got all in a funk, like, it's going to fail. You know, instead I'm like, oh, well, maybe it's going to fail. I'm going to keep working on cool stuff, so I figured out cool things. And usually it didn't fail, and most of the times that everybody's panicked about it, it doesn't fail, and it doesn't fail because of the people that are like, well, let's go for it. Terminal optimism. But it is also a weakness because optimism is a soft hope of... Um, It's a little more carefree than weakness. It's it's like, I don't know if I'm weak or not. Who cares? Let's go for it. I don't know if I can surf this wave. I'll try it. it you know, and but it, there is a hopeful part where, since you don't know, maybe you're being hopeful that you're good enough to do it. Right. Tom Cruise, great example of uh, a nutcase over positive egotist. So, fine. Um, don't know what I meant by that. Let's see. Oh, that's the end of the envelope. Okay, I think I have one more, like five minutes or something.